I'm Janine Shepherd, and this is Win the Day with James Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. Here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Welcome to another episode of the Win the Day podcast. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote today comes from Brene Brown and says, owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. This episode is all about resilience, how you can acquire it, how you can maintain it, and how you can leverage it to own your story and unleash that spirit you have within. Our guest, Janine Shepard, is one of my closest friends, and I can't think of anyone better to guide us on resilience than her. If you've read my book, Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy, you'll remember Janine's story from chapter one. She's the greatest personification of resilience I've ever seen, and I knew that as soon as she shared her story with me, that it would be the first thing people would read to inspire them as they ventured into that book. For a bit of backstory, Janine was a national champion skier and one of Australia's best hopes for the Winter Olympics. But an accident while training destroyed her athletic dreams and nearly ended her life. Paralyzed, Janine spent 10 days in a coma and then the following six months in the spinal ward. She defied the odds by not only learning to walk again, but by creating an entirely new life in the most remarkable way. Janine's story has been featured all over television, including 60 Minutes and This Is Your Life. Her first book, Never Tell Me Never, was made into a feature-length film, and she has since written five other books, including her recently released memoir, Defiant. Her amazing TED Talk has been viewed more than two million times and is still a regular feature on TED.com. Janine has been awarded Australia's highest civilian honour, the Order of Australia, in recognition of her tireless work to raise awareness of spinal cord injury and research. She also serves as ambassador for Red Bull, Wings for Life and Spinal Cure Australia and is one of the world's top inspirational speakers. In this episode, we talk about finding the gift in adversity, coming to terms with your identity, understanding shame and the importance of owning your own story and becoming a resilience machine so nothing can stand in your way. Before we begin, you know the drill, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. And make sure you hit the follow button so you can get access to episodes like this one as soon as they are released. Are you fired up? I am. Let's win the day with Janine the Machine Shepherd. Janine, how are you? I'm exhausted after hearing that. <laughs> it's great to see you in person. Welcome back to America. Thank you. All of one day, slightly jet lagged. <laughs> yes, that's right. We did a good job to, to get you in here shortly off the, off the plane. Yeah. Uh, it's been, what, 34 years or so now since the accident. Mm. How has your perspective on that moment changed over the years and, and how do you feel about it now? Well, gosh, that's a... You know, that's, that's, there's a long answer to that, I, I, I guess. I think my journey has been constantly evolving. And even in the last few years since COVID, I've taken another crazy direction in terms of taking on a PhD. So I'm always learning. I'm always learning about myself, about life, about the journey and about resilience. Mm. You know, it's, I always say resilience is not a line we cross over. It's a journey we take every single day. Mm. So that continues for me and I'm just, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm savoring it and saying yes to it. What is your uh, reality now in terms of chronic pain and, and how are you managing that? Well, I, most people are surprised when I tell them I'm a paraplegic because they see me walking and they say, well, hold on, you're walking. And I say, that's right, because paraplegia is not just about walking. There's a lot of injuries that go along with that, a lot of hidden parts of spinal cord injury. So I've always um, had chronic pain. And I think I'm just, I have a really high pain threshold. People don't know. I actually, when I left hospital after all of the injuries I had, I had a broken arm. I left hospital with a broken arm after almost six months in hospital. And for six years, I did all the things that I did. I learned to fly an aeroplane, did aerobatics, pulling G-forces with a broken arm before I had it fixed. So I think for me, and chronic pain is, I mean, a lot of people suffer from chronic pain and it's a real challenge in life. So I've learned ways to deal with that, to deal with pain in that I, I've learned ways to sort of 
I say it's like turning down the, the radio in the background so I can get on and live with my life. And a lot of that I've learned through um, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is saying, okay, I have this thing in my life, but I'm not going to let it stop me from doing all the things that I want to enjoy. So that can help combat like the irritability and, and other elements that come in from dealing with that. Yeah. It's not like you, you know, it's not like you put up with it, but it's in a way you just, you accept it, mm. that it's part of life and you still do the things that can help, of course. But you say it's like, you know, in acceptance and commitment therapy, it's like, you know, we use the analogy, we say, or the metaphor, we hold up um, a board and we say, if you keep holding that, eventually you're going to get tired. Mm. And that is your pain, for example. So if you put that down, if you learn to put, if you put that down, sorry about that, um, <laughs> you can then go on and do all the things that you want to do in life. You know, you can um, paint a picture or make a coffee or play with your kids or learn an instrument or, <laughs> you know, do the things that you want to do without letting that stop you. Mm. It's still there, mm. but you can get on and enjoy the other things in life. Help us understand more about the, the daily struggles that people with disabilities have that mm. other people might not be aware of. Well, I always say that living with disability for me is like getting up every morning and having to recommit, having to say, you know, as you say, win the day, having to say yes to life. And when you say yes to life, it's all of life. I say life is like the hokey pokey. You know, you do the hokey pokey, you put your left foot in, you put your left foot out. But the best part of the hokey pokey is the end when you put your whole body in and you <laughs> shake it all about. And that's what life is about. I mean, for everybody. Life is painful and joyful, and you've got to say yes to all of life. So for me, I commit every morning to saying yes to whatever challenges I'm going to face in life. And they are, you know, there's very painful days and there's joyful days, but it's all of it. And you can't, and we know, you know, you can quote Brene Brown here too, you know, you can't turn off part of your life and expect to have joy in the other. You've got to take it all. Mm. Got to take the rain and the sunshine. Yeah. So for people with mm. disabilities, depending on what that disability is, I mean, there's lots of hidden disabilities. Um, there's physical disabilities. There's um, psychosocial disabilities. So depending on that, I mean, a lot of people, there's a lot of people in the world, a very high percentage of people in the world that live with disabilities mm -hmm. of some sort. Uh, often people talk about the gift of pain, but they probably haven't faced something like the ordeals and things that you've experienced. How do people who are in the midst of some type of tragedy or, or horrific trauma find the gift when they're still in, in such a dark mm, place? Such a challenge. Well, I can only talk about my own experience. One of the first books I read when I got home from hospital was Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, which has been a seminal book for me in my life and sits by my bedside. And so I always thought, you know, the story of Viktor Frankl, I'm sure many people will know his story, a prisoner of war and um, in the Nazi concentration camps. And, you know, he talks about the things that he did in that camp, you know, finding humour, for example, in, in the most atrocious conditions you can even imagine. And I remember reading that book and thinking, wow, I mean, it's possible, you know, and I've tried to, well, I have, and I've written a resilience course about this, um, for example, finding humour even in the painful times, even almost six months in the spinal ward, there were things that were funny. There were things that we laughed at. There were funny movies that we watched. And humour is, I mean, such an important part of life. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's one thing I would suggest people do. Try to find the humour. Try to do the things that you enjoy in life. There are things that we all savour. Even the small things, like for me, having a coffee in the morning. Mm. I really love doing that. We had a coffee this morning and I really enjoyed that. Um, it's something I look forward to every morning with my partner. We have a ritual of having our coffee together where we turn everything off and we just sit down and listen and talk to each other. The A big thing for me in terms of sort of mental health, I've noticed mm. that I enter into a dark place when I start to resist the feelings. And I guess the opposite of acceptance is that resistance. Have you noticed that people putting up those barriers to try and resist those things? Like you just, you mentioned humor there. Mm. I feel like to have humor, you've got to be in a place of acceptance rather than resistance to be able to, to do that. But that acceptance and awareness of things, good or bad, that are going on in your life rather than resisting it. Is that a big part of all the work that you've done with the School of Resilience and all the resilience things that you lead? Well, that's a, yeah, a great um, insight you have there because acceptance is actually the first step in my 12 steps to resilience. And acceptance is so important because I call it the doorway. You've got to get to the doorway. You've got to accept whatever is happening in life. And for me, 
it, it wasn't to, you know, the point where I got to it when I got home from hospital in a wheelchair, plaster body cast as a paraplegic, having to accept that all of the goals I had in life, going to the Olympics and all the other dreams and goals I had were gone. I really had to accept that before I could move on. It was almost like life was saying, you know, let go of those things and then I'm going to show you something better. Um, I always say that life is a series of loosening our grip on how we think life is supposed to look. Mm. And it's a challenge because we live in a world with with social media. We see everyone else's life. Oh, they're all doing so well. And it's just, it's smoke and mirrors. Yeah. They're not. Everyone is struggling with something. Yeah. And so I really, I mean, I urge people too to sort of limit their time on social media and really spend time in their own um, circle of influence, mm. what they can control. Yeah, the things that bring joy rather than allowing you to benchmark things of someone's perfect shot of an imperfect day. There's a lot of those out there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, the, Brene, the Brene Brown quote that I read out earlier for this episode, owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. What comes to mind when you, when you hear that? Well, I heard another quote recently that was out, out of the Bhagavad Gita, which was a similar quote. It's something along the lines of, um, I don't remember it exactly, but it's about, it's better to live your life imperfectly than to try to live someone else's mm. perfectly. <laughs> so I think it's important, as I said, going back to social media, we see other people's lives and we think it's perfect and we chase those things. But often we, we do that to our own detriment, you know, of really owning our own story and all of it, and which is something that I've had to do recently, which is about integration. And we can push those things away, but they're going to come back. They will come back. You know, it's, it's, um, I mean, I guess that's a rule of life. You know, we can avoid something, but it never really goes away. We're sort of pushing it underneath like the beach ball under the surface, but eventually it's going to pop up. A lot of a lot of the pain that we feel is is self inflicted. We talk about things mm. like shame, um, which can be so debilitating. We allow ourselves to be constricted by things like shame. Uh, in your work, you also talk a lot about the stigma of disability. Can mm. you talk to us about the the burden of shame and the stigma of, of disability and how people can really start to embrace yeah. who they are? Well, for me, I think that you know, I realise now as I'm diving into my disability studies for my PhD that there was a lot of shame around that, and I think that comes from the you know the human desire for belonging, you know, wanting to be like everyone else, and so any sort of condition that we perceive as being different from how everyone else is, there's this sort of sense of shame, like I'm not, you know, I'm meant to be like them, I'm meant to fit in because we have this human need. I mean, it goes way back in time when. Um, you know, hunters and gatherers had to, that's how the tribe survived, you know, being like everyone else. So I think we need to normalize um, differences and disability is one of those. I mean, I look back and there were so many experiences that I had in hospital that gave me that sense of there's something wrong with me, which is, and I know we've talked about this in the past, mm -hmm. the medical model of disability. Mm -hmm. And I subscribe to the social model of disability, which is saying that there's nothing wrong with having a disability. It's really, it's the outside world that needs to change. You mentioned disability theory and things there. If you map that out sort of 10 or 20 years in the future, what mm. are some changes that you would like to see happen? Well, I think changes in, in medicine, changes in architecture so that we include, we're very inclusive. Um, sometimes I go somewhere and there's no lift, for example, mm. and I now am able to speak up. There was a time not that long ago when, I would go somewhere and there'd be no lift and I wouldn't say anything and I'd just, you know, struggle trying to get up the stairs. And now I'll say, well, where's your lift? Well, I think you should think about getting a lift, you know. <laughs> and I know that a lot of buildings are old, but I think as we're building new buildings now, these are just, you know, these are givens that we will include that. Yeah. And um, I think we spoke a little bit about this in the past. Yeah. The medical model, if someone turns up in a wheelchair and there's no ramp, then there's something wrong with that person. And the medical model says... Disability is something that we need to fix. The social model says, well, if there's a ramp there and the person can, can get in, then there's no disability. They're just like everyone else. And so I think that's what we need to move towards. Gee, so much about perspective comes from just getting around a whole bunch of, of different people. There's so much conflict in the world. Mm -hmm. It's because I feel like people stay in their silos. But being able to get out there and ask questions and have 
embrace that genuine curiosity and have that conversation about people from really diverse backgrounds about what they're going through so we mm. can start to move forward together and remove a lot of those barriers that people might have, whether it's something like accessing an event space or a cafe, as well as more inclusive products and, and mm. conversations and everything else. And it's normalising disability. I mean, this is part of the human condition and and that's what makes it so beautiful and so rich. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, these differences are what makes life interesting. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me right now, I want to normalise um, mobility aids. I have a walking stick. I'm, as I told you, I'm just getting a scooter and a wheelchair, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> and, I, you know, I think people feel like there's something wrong with them if they need one of these. I mean, I know people think, oh, I'm getting old. I, th it means that I'm getting old, but we're all getting older. <laughs> and I told you the story of a lady who was in her 90s and her um, granddaughter said, Nan, you need to get a, a wheelchair. And she refused because she felt like it was giving in. And uh, she had a fall and broke a hip and went to hospital and ended up dying. So I feel that there's sad something recently that happened. Um, do you remember the... Um, they had a, for Prince Philip, they had a ceremony mm -hmm. in England and the Queen walked down the aisle. Now, the Queen's in her mid to late 90s, mm -hmm. I think. And they wanted, they asked her if she wanted a wheelchair and apparently the headlines were all, no, she's not going to give in. And I thought that's a really sad message. Yeah. They're worried we about perceived weakness or something. It's in terms not a of, weakness. Why yeah. would it be a weakness to use something that makes life easier? Yeah. That's what I see. If I can have something that... If I'm struggling to walk a long way and I, there's something there that's available for me that will make my life easier so I can save my energy for something else, then why wouldn't I accept that? Yeah. That's Actually be freedom. more empowering for other people to see her in that situation. Exactly. Yeah. She should be, you know, it would have been nice to have seen her embracing that yeah. for other people. The Queen is probably watching this right now, so please, Your Majesty, start using a, a, wheelchair, a wheelchair from her. Yeah, and I hope you get someone to pimp your ride. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you mentioned your PhD earlier. Can you tell us a bit about the work you're doing yeah. with that? Well, that all started when COVID hit again, and that word pivot, we all know about that. And I'd written a resilience course. My partner and I, David, had worked on this course together, and they were the 12 steps that I took to in my recovery. And my daughter, who had studied psychology, said, Mum, you should do a PhD. And I thought, that's ridiculous <laughs> at my age. Who does that? Plus, you've had life's PhD as well. I know. I thought, <laughs> I already have a PhD, really. And so I came back and it started off as I thought, well, um, firstly, I spent a whole year, you know, really working on my proposal and, and trying to find where I would do this. And I landed at Griffith University up in Queensland, which is just a wonderful university up in your part of the world. Queensland, yeah, God's country. God, yeah, really <laughs> concentrating on disability and rehab as well, and I have wonderful supervisors. And so at first we started off, um, the journey was uh, really putting my um, resilience course, which is based on positive psychology interventions, into spinal injury units because I know as a spinal cord patient myself that that's something that would have been really valuable to mm. me. So give people a toolkit to take them through life. And these these interventions are, you know, science-based and they work and I use them. And so in the interim, I started off at that. And in, in the interim, um, I had, I fell over and broke my finger. And I realized that my daughters and one of them is a doctor said, mom, you need to go and see someone about this. You're falling over a lot. And then I revisited the spinal injury unit and that's when I, um, my occupational therapist said, well, have you thought about a wheelchair? Mm. And this is when this feeling of shame came in because it actually was this sort of existential crisis. You know, I went home, I was in tears and I felt like I'm giving up. Mm. And so in that process of doing this deep dive into why I had these feelings of shame around getting a wheelchair, um, my PhD completely changed. So my supervisor said to me, wow, now that's a PhD. Mm. So it's now changed into what we call an autoethnography and it's really a an exploration of what it has been as someone who's got lived embodied experience of disability in a sort of wider cultural, societal and political context. So that's the PhD now. Yeah, I, I want to make sure that's really clear for everyone. So mm. you resisted that but then found strength mm. in the acceptance of going to the wheelchair rather than what you thought was finding strength for the last, you know, you've been around the world speaking at the most accomplished and most successful companies mm. on the planet. 
you teaching them about strength and resilience and all these different things, but strength for you in the present now has been about leaning into those feelings and accepting the wheelchair. Exactly. And accepting all of the parts of me, like the hokey pokey yeah. and saying that strength, you know, there are times when I'll be walking and there'll be times when I won't be able to walk and I'll be in my wheelchair. And so um, that's a choice I'm making and that's a strength. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the feelings of shame, you know, one example is when I was in the spinal ward and I um, very early on when I was about to leave the spinal injury unit and I was sitting outside in my wheelchair on the grass and people would come in to visit and they would look at me and walk straight past me and, you know, didn't want to look. And so I internalised these feelings of shame around, well, there's something wrong with me. And these, you know, these sort of internal ableist messages I've carried my entire life, which is it's bad to be disabled or there's something wrong with me, so try and fit in. And I realize now that it's sort of caught up with me as I've gotten older and, and that I don't need to fit in. What I need to do is say yes to all of the parts of me. Yeah, that relationship with others starts with the relationship you have with yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And that's what integration is all about. Mm. And, you know, feeling that, um, and, and I think it's really an important message, not just for disability, but whether it's gender or race or whatever it is, mm. it's about owning and, and embracing and honoring our differences. Mm. If you're a business owner and want a copy of the 10 biggest mistakes business owners make with their podcast, go to mistakes.wearepodcast.com or click the link in the show notes. It's a free download and we'll show you everything you need to do to start getting a massive ROI from your podcast so you can help a lot more people, get recognized as the authority in your industry and scale your business faster than ever. All right, let's get back into the fun. Do you have anything you've incorporated into your morning routine or daily routine that help gets you primed or, or in the right headspace or even something that you do before you do a, a really important keynote? Well, my go-to, which is my last step in my resilience course, is gratitude. And of course, I'm a big fan of gratitude. So you're it's... going to say coffee. The well, yeah, <laughs> that too. I'm grateful for my coffee. <laughs> grateful for my coffee. So gratitude is um, its probably one of the most research um aspects in positive psychology and it works mm -hmm. and there's science behind it and it's easy, you know. So even a simple thing like waking up in the morning and this morning in the comfortable bed in your house, <laughs> I woke <laughs> up and I thought, oh, this is such a comfortable bed. <laughs> I'm so grateful for this. And, you know, I'm grateful for my coffee and I'm grateful for, you know, there's so much to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's a sort of a go-to thing for me, mm -hmm. feelings of gratitude. Yeah. yeah. Uh, your TED Talk is exceptional. In the Day One Mastermind recently, you shared your response when someone asked how long you need to prepare for, mm. and you said, how good do you want it to be? And oh my God, I'll, ne I'll never forget <laughs> that. How that, that, that response there, like how long do you need to prepare for? How good do you want it to be? I feel like it's so transferable across mm. so many different areas. You're preparing for another TED Talk right now. What are you doing to prepare for that occasion? Well, it's part of my PhD as well. It's part of the trying to, you know, I'm spending a lot of time in what do I want my message to be? So with my first TED Talk, uh, it, which is called A Broken Body Isn't a Broken Person, the original title was You're Not Your Body. So that was the message around that. And I constructed that for those that have seen it or will go and watch it. it you know, I had five chairs on stage based around Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey because I'm a big fan of that. So in the same way, I'm going to take my time with this in terms of deciding where I want to do this TED Talk, what stage I want to do it on, what my message is going to be. And so I'm planning to do it in a year's time. I will be working on this for a year. So I spend a lot of time really constructing the message and working out the most powerful way to tell this story, which will be around the disability paradox. When you go on stage, are you thinking about your presentation? Are you thinking about how you're feeling? Are you thinking about serving the audience? Are you thinking about the event organizers, are you thinking about, I need a glass of water? Like what, what, are you, what are you thinking about when you walk out on stage for these really important events? Always about serving the audience. You know, I worked on my TED Talk with my really good friend, Dean Carey, who was Hugh Jackman's drama coach. And he gave me this great tip, which was when, you're, when you walk out, so, you know, there's everyone, it was completely dark. So I really couldn't see anybody. He said, before you even start talking, pause, look out into the audience and say silently to yourself, I see you, I honor you. And then look to the other part of the audience and say the same thing. Do that three times, which is what I did. 
And to me, it's about connection, like being a great speaker um, or a TED talker or, or, you know, presenter is about connecting with the audience. I always say you've got to be able to reach in and grab their heart and you've got to connect on their level. Yeah, and clearly, based on the number of views, you know, it's done an amazing yeah. job, not to mention all of your other speeches as well. Um, we've spoken a lot about resilience today. What about yeah. for parenting? What can we do to raise strong, resilient children? Well, I'm asked that question a lot, and I'm a mother of three myself, and I know that my kids are incredibly resilient. And if I look back, I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't formally studying resilience when my kids were young, but they watched me, and I realised that that's how we learn resilience from the people that we that are around us. And um, you know, there's hope theory, for example, says that uh, hope is built on goals, pathways, and agency. And I think that. You know, for me, you know, learning to fly and having goals and working out ways to make that work because things don't always go to plan. So you've got to be, you know, able to problem solve and shift and pivot and change and have a new goal or a new way of approaching it. So my kids have grown up watching me do that and they're incredibly resilient. So for anyone that's a parent that's wondering, well, how do we raise resilient kids? And I say, well, work on the skills yourself mm. because your kids are watching you very, very closely. Yeah, even late teenage, young adult phase, is that one of the most important times, if not the most important in terms of modeling the behaviors, even if they feel like they're putting up big barriers with their behavior and making it look like they're not observing you? Well, I think you start wherever you are. Yeah. You know, one exercise that I actually do with, even I did it with a corporate group a week ago in Sydney, mm. which is 10 Good Things. And um, it's something that I adapted from a Viktor Frankl book. And so it's a way to... Um, I guess, cultivate optimism. And optimism is um, one of another step in my course. And optimism is a very important part, um, again, of uh, positive psychology. Martin Seligman says it's a great buffer for anxiety and depression. So a great exercise I say you can do with your kids. You sit down, you're around the kitchen table and, you know, they've had a bad day. And you say, okay, let's think of 10 good things about that. And I give an example. I say, well, let you know, 10 good things about the toilet paper shortage. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fun, you know, and I make it fun and just make it crazy as well. But I always, with the corporate groups, I'll say, write 10 good things about the pandemic. And I get people to write that down and share it. And it's really wonderful. It's a way of shifting our perspective. And that's really what optimism is about. It's our explanatory style of anything that we're going through in life. Mm -hmm. If you had to narrow your success, and I know you're still doing amazing things on this planet, if you had to narrow down your success to this point down to a single decision that you have made in your life, what would that be? Learning to fly. Because mm. that was the moment that I let go. That was the moment that I let go of the dreams, the goals of going to the Olympics, of seeing myself as a, an athlete mm. and, and accepting the challenge of life. Okay, tell me what I'm meant to do. Mm. I'm, you know, I'm not in control of this, but I am in control of, you know, w what's going forward. I mm. couldn't change the fact that a speeding driver had ran me over, run me over, but okay, from here on, this is up to me. Mm. I'm taking responsibility. I love that, that extreme ownership. Mm. Mm. We're now two and a half years into COVID, crazy time for the world, a lot of disconnection, a lot of separation for people with their families, difficult to travel, a lot of businesses and, and um, shifts in all society. What have you learned about yourself during that time? Well, I've learned that I'm capable of doing a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> tick. Yeah, yeah, tick. Um, just that, I, you know, I, I, I have a great sense of my own resilience. Mm and uh, connection with other people. So uh, I guess that I'm able to accept a, a even an, an even deeper level the parts of myself that I've been trying to hide. Mm. 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 Yeah, there's many layers, isn't there, for us all to work through. We're all, all a work in progress. Yeah, we're always peeling back the layers of the onion. Yeah. It's just how it is. Uh, final question before we move into the rocket round. On your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard that you could show yourself on your worst day? Oh, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <nice. laughs> Thank you.
All right, let's move into the win the day rock around. Ten questions for some fairly quick answers. You up for this one? Yep. <laughs> Number one, <laughs> what quote inspires you the most? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Mm. Mary Good Oliver. One. Yeah. One of my favorite poets. It's fantastic. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you probably want me to say both, but of course, morning coffee. I'm an Aussie. I'm an Aussie. Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18 year old self? Mm. Festina Lente, hasten slowly. Mm. Number four, what book do you gift the most? Men's Search for Meaning. Mm. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Yeah, accepting my disability. Mm. Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? There is none. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone mm. alive or dead, who would it be? My dad who's passed. Mm. I'd thank him for being by my side in hospital. Mm. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? Mm. Google Scholar. <laughs> <laughs> what's Google Scholar? I haven't even heard of that. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you go to Google, put in Google Scholar, you can access all academic papers. Wow. Incredible. Google if you Scholar. want to really get to the science behind something and know that something is quotable yeah. and you know, the science behind it. Yeah. Nice. Google's in everything. Well mm. done, Google. Number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. My PhD, but I'm going to share two and the movie that we're <laughs> working on at the moment. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and final question, what's one thing you do to win the day? Express gratitude every day. Mm. I love it. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Janine and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow her on Instagram at Janine underscore Shepherd. Grab a copy of her amazing new book, Defiant, and download your free resilience checklist. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Janine, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that interview. As you heard, our guests love to hear positive feedback no matter where they're at in their careers. So share a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway so our guests know they made a difference in your life today. If you're a business owner and want a copy of the 10 biggest mistakes business owners make with their podcast, go to mistakes.wearepodcast.com or click the link in the show notes. It's a free download and we'll show you everything you need to do to start getting a massive ROI from your podcast so you can help a lot more people, get recognized as the authority in your industry and scale your business faster than ever. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe or follow button so you can get access to episodes like this one as soon as they are released. The Win The Day podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Finally, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always. Thank <laughs> you.